Well, hello everybody and welcome. This is We Are, Lizzie and Justin from Third Space and this is the Turning Towards Life podcast. And you're also welcome to be here. This is our 353rd week. So we are walking a path step by step. I was thinking, Lizzie, it won't be very long until we've got a year's worth of episodes if you listened one every day. Yeah. We're heading there when we get to the end of our seventh year, which we're close to. That's the consequence. So I'm very glad to be back here with you and very glad to welcome all of you who are here listening, maybe watching all the different ways that you listen and watch. You can find us on YouTube, on Facebook, in our Facebook group, um, in all the podcast places and on the Turning Towards Life website. And we're going to do what we ordinarily do, which is to start with a source, which is a piece of writing that's like a wellspring that unfolds into a who knows what conversation between you and me, Lizzie, which is always very rich and surprising. And I'm very glad to be doing this. And this week, uh, we're very lucky to have a source written by you. Mm. Thanks, Justin. I suddenly got some bodily reaction when you said, this is the Turning Towards Life podcast. It's like it's got an identity. <laughs> it's it's a, a being in the world, the podcast that is Turning Towards Life. And I'm just, uh, I don't know, forever stunned and grateful and shocked that this exists. <laughs> And we do this. It's really cool. And we have done it for so long and it feels so timeless to me. And like whenever you say how many weeks or how long we've done it for or whatever, it's so strange because it just it feels like such a thread that I I could I wouldn't be able to tell you. I'd say, I don't know, a year or two we've maybe done this. <laughs> it's really long and wonderful. So we have this little piece of something that I tumbled out of me the other day and it's a very kind of unpolished something but I feel like it leads us to the territory that's making me curious at the moment so here we go I've called it the gift of loving give the gift of loving you to others ask for their help we seem to have learned that helping involves sacrifice So we think that by asking for help, we're asking people to make a sacrifice. So we don't ask. We try and do it all alone. And we forget that people can just say no. So it is okay to simply ask. Maybe life is about the giving and receiving of gifts. It's a true joy when someone feels loved and we have something to do with it. So what are we doing removing opportunities for people to love us, taking this away from them, this joy of loving us? If we all knew what it meant to truly say no and what a true yes means, what kind of love-filled, supported world might we find? Thanks, Lizzie. It's really excellent hearing that read in the voice with which it was written. Um, So I'm going to read it in my voice. The gift of loving. Give the gift of loving you to others. Give the gift of loving you to others ask for their help. We seem to have learned that helping involves sacrifice, so we think that by asking for help, we're asking people to make a sacrifice. So we don't ask. We try and do it all alone, and we forget that people can just say no, so it's okay to simply ask. Maybe life is about the giving and receiving of gifts. It's a true joy when someone feels loved and we have something to do with it. So what are we doing removing opportunities for people to love us, taking this away from them, this joy of loving us? If we all knew what it meant to truly say no and what a true yes means, what kind of love-filled supported world might we find thank you justin Hmm. so this last line justin feels like the heart of it in a way like like if it was implicit that we all knew 
that we could say yes and no freely. I think the whole thing about yes and no's is such a big thing. <laughs> like we could be saying yes to things for so many different reasons. And saying yes to something because it's true for me and right for me to say yes feels so much more of a rare thing than saying yes because of social norms or saying yes because of guilt or saying yes because I should or saying yes because that's what one does or some other complex reason. And of course, all of those things have their place. But if there was a way that we each knew when we did say yes and we did say no, but when we did say those words, it really, really was okay for us. You know, there was no complexity in it. It's a straightforward yes or a straightforward no. I feel like the world would be a really different place. And, and the relationship that we each have to know as well I don't know, maybe feels even more complex. Maybe it's not, I don't know. Even more complex than saying yes, because people's, I feel like we've been conditioned to say yes in whatever system that we're in as well. And so when someone says no, it can be like, what? Someone saying no to being asked something? Like, is that even a legitimate possible thing? So, and I think, this is the last line of this in a way because the implicit in this last line seems to answer this whole complex question about how come we have this really deep running independence narrative in the world and we don't really know how to ask for help so often we just don't know how to do it and if we do it it's so cringeful and so awful and we're only going to do it if we just absolutely have to and it doesn't seem like a very normal thing for people to ask for help. And there's shame around it because if I need help, it means that I'm weak or I'm lesser than or I'm not able or there's something wrong with me or something. There's so many connotations to, to asking for help. And yet they seem to be true kind of on the inside of us, but they don't seem to be true for the people that we're asking something of. I um I so appreciate your writing always, Lizzie, because you you have a way of writing in a way that's very straightforward about something that gets us into really into the thick of something that's very deep, actually. So you and I know this because you've been one of those people who've many times told me all the ways I'm not receiving help. And I know it seems to me that the thing about it is yes to everything that you've said and uh, part of the what makes it so complicated aside from all the other things that I'm not going to talk about that make it complicated like background culture and how we're socialized in our family systems or whatever caregiving systems we're in and how, how um, gender socialization and uh, narratives of individualism and all of these things which we can talk about some of which you've hinted at another part of what's going on is it's such a tender relational topic if if i ask you for help i'm almost inevitably projecting onto you all of my experiences of being asked for help myself and also all of my own pain and vulnerabilities and tendernesses and wishes to be in control and all of that. At least that's the, the thing that happens for me. So I'm, I'm, um, became aware as you were reading of the many times that I don't ask for help because what essentially I'm doing is, um, projecting onto you a ton of stuff. You won't like it, you'll feel burdened, it will be an imposition, it will be an interruption. Um, you'll feel like you're obligated. Um, I'll have to then make myself vulnerable. This is the bit that will stay with me. I have to make myself vulnerable and uh, because receiving is tender and vulnerable. And if all of those things that I've just projected onto you happen to be true and I'm making myself vulnerable, that's not going to feel very nice for me. And it's a great big tangle. And um, So I really appreciate your call here to a certain kind of simplicity. 
like in a way what you're saying is maybe not even in a way what you're saying is what if we could imagine some sort of basic principles and the first basic principle is loving someone else is a gift and that requires us making ourselves available to be loved that's like principle one um principle two uh, yes means yes and no means no uh, principle three everyone's entitled to say yes or no according to what's meaningful to them <laughs> you know it, in a way it's very very simple but it's not simple because of the whole of mirrors of being in of being in relationship in which I'm imagining what you think about what I think about what you think and what you feel about what I feel and what you feel and all the socialization that we've had in the past so actually I know for me it's both um, the feeling of asking for and receiving help very often is what I most long for and what I can be most afraid of when it happens it's the most blessed relief like it is so good to be loved by people who love me it's gorgeous and it's tender and i feel tearful saying it and there are protective parts of me that go don't go there and there are all the stories about being strong and reliable and um so to get to the the basic principles there's quite a lot of letting go that we have to do and a very large dose of learning to trust ourselves and the people who love us as well and in a way if i say this in quite a harsh way it occurs to me as i say this that when we don't do that essentially if i don't allow myself to receive your help lizzie i'm i'm communicating to you i don't trust you to help me mm -hmm. And that's painful to admit that actually to, to say, oh, I get that by trying to protect myself from all of the mm. worries that I might have, I'm saying to you, uh, you're not safe to help me. I'm not safe to be helped. And that's a real tragedy. And in fact, this morning, we're just completing the end of a year of the third space professional coaching courses. Of course, you know, Lizzie, and somebody in the group said this morning, it had occurred to them that one of the biggest causes of suffering is because we don't know that giving and receiving love to one another is what resolves most things mm. because of all of this that I've just been saying. Mm. Yeah, that's really resounding in me just in this, this whole thing about trust. If I'm not asking you for help, I'm not trusting you. And I know that I've had experiences in my life where I have asked for help and the way that the help has been given hasn't held, they haven't held that their, because it's a power dynamic, isn't it? And so when I'm the asker, I have less power than when I'm the asked. And when I'm the asked and I hold that opportunity to bring in some conditionality or to make someone feel like they're less than for having asked me or something. If I wield my power in an unhealthy way, it really confirms the dynamic that it's not safe to ask for help. And so in a way, I think that vulnerability has a place. It really has a place. And so I'm just asking myself this question, you know, how do we all become trustworthy enough to be asked for help? And then how do we, let people know like what what are the ways we can let people know that we're safe to be asked and how can we also tell when there's safety inside the person we're going to ask and when there isn't and as you say relationally it's a really really big thing and and justin i often think about this saying no thing because i think it's easy to say, isn't it? Oh, well, we're just going to experiment with saying no to things and see what more capacity we might have or what the patterns are about taking too much stuff on. You know, I think we all have, lots of people have that. And I always think, well, the first step is saying no, and then you have to deal with all the fallout of saying no. <laughs> and then, well, where's that conversation? You know, where's the conversation about the response that people have when you start standing up for yourself or when you start putting some boundaries in place 
because the people who've been enrolled in your saying yes all this time are going to be like, uh, excuse me, you haven't said no for 40 years and now you're suddenly saying no. That's not part of our shared narrative of what happens around here. So what's going on? And then it's a really, really interesting conversation to unpack and find a way through to explaining why you have to say no now or why your boundaries are suddenly different than they were before and what process you've been through. And it feels really complex. And for many of us, such a necessary step in our development to to reclaim our own dignity or to reclaim our own sense of being powerful and having capacity and cottoning on to the fact that what I'm doing is making my life the way that it is. Mm-hmm. So the way that I'm saying yes is leaving me overburdened or, or equally the way I'm saying no to everything is leaving my life really, really small because I it's too scary to take the risk of saying yes or something. Mm-hmm. But either way, shifting the balance of yeses and nos, whichever way we're doing it, is a very big old process and a re-establishment of, or um, maybe not a re-establishment, but an establishment of a new set of boundaries, a new set of yeses and nos for myself. And I just think that's a really big deal. I'm, um, I'm thinking from what you're saying about the mind reading and storytelling we do. Mm. Actually, what I was thinking about, this might sound like a bit of a tangent, but it's not intended to be really. I was doing some reading in a book actually quite a long time ago about ants and how they communicate with one another. And they have a a pretty limited repertoire of interactions, which never change. Like a, an interaction just means what it means, which is, makes things probably in one way very simple in the world of ants. Mm. But in the world of humans, w- w- because we're self-reflective storytelling beings, we're not just, when I say something to you, it doesn't always mean the same thing to me and the same thing to you. It, it's it got a whole load of context, all the things that you've just said. Well, from me, a no to you means something different from a no to someone else, because we've had this relationship for this time and there's never been a no in it before and now. So I know that you have got all of that going on and I can't know all of what it is. And I've got all the mm. things going on as well, including my story about you. So we have this difficulty, us humans, which is that uh, I was, it, it occurred to me that the difficulties in, we started off by talking about how important it is to receive help and then you brought in how important it is to give help well. And the difficulty in both is kind of the same. They're related to one another because if I am not in a conversation with you to understand what receiving help well for you is, and I imagine that I'm meant to know, like the ants know already what every gesture means, then it's tricky territory when I start to help you and it's tender territory. And I might well hold back from helping you because I feel unskilled in I meant to know how to help you, but I don't. And I'm not talking to you about it, but I'm trying to do it well. And because I'm trying to do it well, it'd be better for me not to do it. Or maybe I'll do it and I'll, you know, it won't be good for you. And, uh, you know, it's, it's terrifically complicated. And the antidote to it is something hard and necessary, which is being in the right level of conversation about it. So there comes a time when I come to know at least for now, that the very particular way in which it's helpful to help you is this or that. It's bringing you a cup of tea at eight in the morning and not at nine and not at five and not a cup of coffee. Or And I can only really learn that, become skillful in your world, Lizzie, by talking to you and listening to you and talking to you and listening to you and watching you. Like I have to learn Lizzie in order to do that well. And in order to receive, you have to learn mm. Justin well. Mm. And if we are prepared to do that, which involves a lot of talking, not just about, not just the helping, but a lot of sufficient talking about what it means and what it felt like and how, what the impact was when I did this and you did this. Mm. If we can do enough of that, then we come to know one another in an easier groove. The, The sort of the basic rules about giving and taking that I advanced earlier become more simple. And then we have to know that I change and you change over time. So we can never really stop talking because 
the cup of tea at eight in the morning may turn into something else that's helpful. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think that may be one of the things that, that, so learning to really speak and listen at the right level really helps. And you can only do that by practicing speaking and listening, listening, and it really helps to do what we can to make it safe for one another to do that. Mm. Like I'll really listen to you, Lizzie, even if I don't understand you, and even if you tell me that the cup of tea wasn't welcome, and that's a bit, and I have to deal with my feelings about that. And uh, lots of us didn't get yet sufficient opportunity to really practice that because very early on we got into the whole sort of bigger story about I have to be competent and I have to be self-contained and I have to be all of which work against the meeting of one another and the meeting, the knowing that you're really different to me, even though we share humanity. So there's lots that I can, by my sensitivity and empathy can reach, but there's also lots I can't know unless I, unless I talk to you about it, unless you talk to me about it. Yeah, I'm really feeling the kind of how much just gets in the way of of what seems like a simple something. This is so much in the way that we relate to each other, isn't there? And yeah, we can say, I'm going to ask for some help. And then a whole world of complexity opens up. But then I suppose process-wise, if we see our lives as an unfolding process, that feels like a very, a very good beginning, <laughs> you know, because it, because what gets uncovered there then is everything that's going on. You know, the minute I begin to say no, I'll be given all of this information about what everyone is expecting of me and not expecting of me that I may or may not have known. And I'll see why I've been saying yes all of this time because of probably the responses I get when I say no. <laughs> And then I get to build my strength, my inner strength to be aligned with something that's not just what someone else needs, but what I need and what resources me and what has me feel aligned with my life rather than only with others' lives or something. So in a way, it's like peeling back a layer of something that conceals a lot of life, a lot of dynamics, a lot of what's really going on around here stuff. And so it it's uh, it's a big deal. And, it, you know, again, we come back to this so often, but if there isn't sufficient relationship in order to be able to have the conversation to unpack the response to me saying no, and then the relationship being what's of primary importance rather than whether you say yes or no to me being of primary importance. I mean, first of all, that's a great piece of information. <laughs> Because if our relationship is only based on me saying yes to everything that you say, it's maybe not very healthy and maybe we need to look at it. So I'm feeling the the big invitation of this and the big kind of, um, yeah, the big, the big questions really that still live here forever, I think, for me. Because it truly is a gift when... I can feel that someone has been supported in a, by something that I did or said or something or other. That is a gift to me. I know that I'm receiving in the giving for sure. And so it's not, it's not a one way deal. It's not as if I give something to you and I'm completely devoid of any experiencing in that. I'm experiencing a lot in that which is knowing that I made a difference and feeling the joy at your joy is a great joy. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. So for you to give me the opportunity to do that is itself a gift. And so it starts just feeling like a kind of backwards and forwards simultaneous thing. And I think there's a luxury in this conversation as well of kind of fleshing out just in, even in a small bit feels luxurious of why people often say that giving and receiving is the same thing. Because I'm not sure, I don't know, maybe it's not the same thing, but it's simultaneous. <laughs> so 
it's happening at the same time because the moment I give to you, I'm also receiving the gift of giving. And I think if, if I wander around the world with that awareness in me that when I'm giving, I'm receiving at the same time, it also shifts my motivations for things too. So it'd be really hard for me to, I don't even know if this is true as I'm saying it, but I'm, you know, this dynamic where I kind of think that I'm saving you from something, you know, when you notice that that's much, just as much about me as it is about you, that awareness really matters in that power dynamic that we were talking about as well. So I know that I'm participating in this in a particular way. Then I can, only then can I ask myself, oh, how, how am I holding this? How am I holding the person that I'm giving to? And how am I being respectful of them given how vulnerable that they are? And how then do I want to hold the position of relative power that I have as the giver? So I'm really... Yeah, I feel very opened up and kind of intrigued with the pulling this apart and seeing what it is. And glad that we're in the conversation. And and again, I just feel like, oh gosh, this needs to continue forever and ever so that I find some, I don't know, subtitles or something. <laughs> Go through all of the different things that we're really talking about here. I think I've got three parting thoughts. So one is maybe the way through is to take up what you said, which is can we give in a way that allows us to receive the gifts of giving and can we receive in a way that allows us to give the gifts of receiving? Mm. Like can we be mm. can we be attend to that because that gets round and under the power place that are in it? Sometimes we give because that make, gives us power and sometimes we receive, refuse to receive because that gives us power and mm -hmm. we're all jostling for power. Mm -hmm. Sometimes what we have to do. So that's thought number one. I can't remember what thought number two is, but I do remember what thought number three <laughs> is, which is I was just thinking about uh, formality and informality and how formality and formal cultures of various kinds deal with this by having very prescribed rituals about who can give and who can receive and mm -hmm. how you give and receive many of those enshrine particular power dynamics like you know men can do this and women can do this can't all of those you know certain kinds of people can do this and certain people can't but all of the you know any culture where we participate in formal interchanges what they do is they free us Mm. from the relational complexity here and so what we're talking about is a kind of where we're in where we're not in those cultural settings or where we, we want to change those cultural settings but where we're in a more kind of intimacy with one another um and thank goodness i think thank goodness that many of the kinds of constraining formality in the world that really kept people from encountering one another are, have been undone but i also feel respectful of how difficult it is then to navigate this this territory when every interaction with another person is a great mystery mm -hmm. and there are no rules to guide us apart from figuring you know jostling and figuring mm -hmm. as it asks it asks a lot of us i don't have any particular place to go but it's a sort of a subtitle question that's mm -hmm. opening up in me as we talk mm -hmm. yeah I think I'm I'm finishing this time together, Justin, in, in this big wondering about whether I even notice what all of those formal things are, <laughs> and they're they're everywhere. I can feel it, and I can see a few, but I'm thinking, my gosh, now this is another another way to encounter life is to see where there are these implicit formal um, protocol or something, <laughs> you know, human protocols. Like this is what you do. And then if those don't get done, what gets opened up? And what do they take care of for us all? I've never really looked at that. And I feel really curious to begin looking. Um, so this feels like a conversation of openingness, Justin, and the opposite of anything conclusive or like 
um, nailing anything down, which I love. And thank you for this open space and the wondering and that we can bring things that we're wondering about and just hang around in them. I really appreciate that. And thank you everybody for being with us. Thank you for dangling in the questions with us and wondering. And as always, we'd love to hear from you. If you ever want to email us, you can, or join our Facebook group and comment or support us on our, buy, buy us a coffee thing on our website and turning towards top life. We'd love to hear from you. And we will be here again next week for the Turning Towards Life podcast again. We will. Thank you, Lizzie. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone.